Tonight is December 21st, so we're getting darker and darker. That uh, kind of fits the uh, Christmas narratives, actually both of them. We just read from Luke 2.9 that they were keeping watch over their flocks at night. And then, of course, the wise men were following a star, so I imagine that's at night. We think of uh, people up at night. What do people think about when they're up at night? And that's where we're going to go down through the Psalms. What are they thinking about when they're up at night? Well, we have uh, poems and songs. They're thinking in the old days of sugar plums. I don't think I've ever been up at night thinking of plums. My grandmother told me she was really, really glad when oranges started coming all year round in Michigan from down south. So she was happy for that, but plums? I don't think we're going to be up at night thinking about plums. We have in Genesis, Abraham was up at night. He was looking at the stars, and God said, the number of your descendants will be countless, just like we can't count the stars. Jacob had a dream, but he was kind of awake in the sense that the ladder came down right where he had his head on a rock for a pillow. That's kind of odd, but the ladder came down and he dreamed about the angels going up and the angels coming down, which is kind of like uh, God is sending blessings to you, Jacob. So there are dreams at night and people awake at night. We're going to look at some psalms where the psalmist could not sleep. What was he thinking about when he was up all night? Now, they're not far from each other, so I didn't make notes, but the first one will be Psalm chapter 3. So if you'll please come to Psalm chapter 3. And we will read around it, but we'll read Psalm 3, verse 3, 5 and 6, and 8. And these are all texts where the person can't sleep and they're up all night. What are they thinking about? Verse 3. But you, O Lord, are a shield around me, my glory and the one who lifts my head. Verse 5. Sleeping verses. Verse 5, I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. Verse 8, salvation, mainly from these enemies, belongs to the Lord. Your blessings be upon your people. Now, uh, verse 1, many adversaries. King James, verse 1. Many en enemies, verse 2, the enemies are saying there is no deliverance for your soul. However, the person is up at night in verse 3 saying, God is like a shield. All kinds of people out there, let's call them troublemakers. All kinds of people causing problems, and yet he's up at night saying, God is like a shield. God will protect. He will protect his own child. Can we say son or daughter? Often in the Bible it's uh, sons, but he protects sons or daughters. He's thinking about his enemies at night. Troublemakers. They can cause me many problems. I'll have to turn them over to you, God. It looks like in verse 5 he fell asleep, but then he woke up again. He fell asleep, then he also awoke, thinking about, the Lord sustains me. Now, the Hebrew word here is keeps. And I think it's okay they translated it, the Lord sustains me, because uh, keeps refers to saving something. That's what we think of first, uh, keeping it for a long time. 
but they would often think of a gatekeeper. And that's what's uh, being here translated sustain, but also the Lord keeps me. The Lord is like a gatekeeper. He will watch. He will stand guard over all these troublemakers, over all these enemies. They like the word keep. Numbers 6, which they quoted a lot, the Lord bless you and keep you. And then also the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. But also the Lord will keep you. Salvation from sin belongs to God and by trusting in Jesus as Savior. Although here with salvation, it's kind of like, save me from all these troublemakers. Save me from this list of troubles. So in Psalm chapter 3, the psalmist is up all night. What's he thinking about? God's protection from this troublemakers. He will bring me glory. Verse 6 again, I will not be afraid of 10,000 of them. So in Psalm chapter 3, God is protecting from the troublemakers. And the psalmist is up all night saying, take care of all these problem people for me. We don't need to go far. Again, that's why I didn't print out notes because the next one is just Psalm chapter 4. So if you'll just turn a little bit to Psalm chapter 4. And again, the psalmist is up at night. And we'll look at verses 4 and 5 and 7 and 8. Tremble and do not sin. Meditate upon your, in your heart upon your bed. See, he's sleeping up or whatnot, up at night. Be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and trust in the Lord. Verse 7, you have put gladness in my heart more than their grain and new wine abound. In peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. Now, verse 4 says tremble. And that could be about enemies. On the other hand, from Paul's interpretation of these verses, he is trembling in anger. Psalm 6 was protect me from my enemies, and now in Psalm 3 was protect me from my enemies. And here is Psalm 4, and it's kind of like I'm really mad, and I'm up at night, and I'm thinking how to get even with them. Tremble. Righteous anger. That's the way Paul interpreted it. Tremble. In Ephesians 4.26, he says, Do not let the sun go down upon your wrath. Be angry. It was wrong. But sin not. Get over it. Uh, don't be angry like this the very next day. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So here the person is awake and they are mad and it was right. They were wronged. But God is saying, put it away in a day. Now, I think we can deal with our righteous anger. It can be motivation. Righteous anger can make us do important things. Um, I was a little bit mad at the way my brother got treated with his mental illness. So rather than be mad about it all the time, you motivate and try to do something about it. And there can be other things. Anyway, uh, he's up at night and... Uh, it's saying, uh, go ahead and be angry. It wasn't wrong to be angry. It was righteous indignation. They mistreated you. On the other hand, turn it over into doing something that is right. Put it away and figure out what can be done about it. Uh, Paul's interpreting the trembling here is how we are interpreting it. And uh, if we will add to his Ephesians 4 verses, he says, let all bitterness... Wrath, anger, clamor, slander, be put away from you. Next verse, be kind one to another, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. 
So in chapter 3, he was up all night worrying about troublemakers. Here in chapter 4, he's up all night, kind of mad, but uh, put the troublemakers away and put the anger away and turn it into a motivation to get something done that is good. So there's Psalm 3 and 4. The next one in the order would be Psalm 16. We're looking at up at night verses. So, uh, up at night, thinking about troublemakers, worry, uh, don't be afraid, and let God take care of the troublemakers. Now, in Psalm 16, I mainly want to read the last part, but in the first part, might just look at it. Verse 1, preserve me. He's thinking about preservation. He also is thinking about other good people. Now, we will stress that he's thinking about what God will do for him in eternity. But he did think about other good people. We have that in verse 3. The saints are the majestic ones. And he delights in them. So, secondarily, he's up at night thinking about all the good people that are his friends and all the good people that are his supporters. But in verses 7 through 11, he's up at night thinking about God, he's particularly thinking about, I'm going to live forever. So let's look at verse 7 and following. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I have set the Lord continually before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall dwell securely. You will not abandon my soul to the grave. Neither will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. I'm not going to rot forever. Verse 11, you have made known to me the path of life. Where is he going? In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. Now, we're mainly going to stress that he's up all night thinking about eternity and thinking about eternal life. Uh, I do want to look at verse 7 a little bit, and uh, I guess it's just my thoughts. Bring in the right to life in verse 7. You wouldn't think so, but it says, My mind instructs me in the night. The actual Hebrew word is odd. It's my kidneys instruct me. Isn't that odd? My kidneys instruct me in the night. Okay. Now, we, we translate it heart, cardia in Greek, lev in Hebrew. But this is actually kidneys. And there are many times in the Old Testament where kidney equals a person's soul or spirit. Now, I'm bringing this in mainly for a right to life because Psalm 139 talks about unborn children. And it says, A, you have formed my inward parts, but literally, you owned my kidneys. King James leaves it alone. I think that's probably for the best if there's a footnote with it because kidney refers to the immaterial nature of humanity before the baby is born. Psalm 139. Unborn children have the beginning of, or maybe even fully, soul and spirit. And God owns them. The government doesn't own them. The doctor doesn't own them. The mother and father doesn't own them. God owns them. So that all came about from the stress of the word kidney. And uh, it's here in verse 7, but it's also Psalm 139. You possessed my immaterial nature before I was ever born. Here in verse 7, it's also immaterial nature. I'm up all night 
verse 7, and uh, you are instructing my soul or my spirit. I'm up thinking at night. Psalm 3 was thinking about worries. Psalm 4 was thinking about anger. Psalm 16, he's mainly up all night thinking about eternity. That can make sense. The day is over. One last day. How many more are there? How many more are there in lifespan? But then that makes a person think about eternity. So the psalmist is up at night thinking about forever and ever and ever. You will not abandon your Holy One to decay. You will take your Holy One out of Sheol, which actually means the grave, the underparts. It can refer to deeper, the place of the departed in the Old Testament times, Sheol. But it can refer to the grave also. It probably refers to both of them here. But uh, we are stressing today that he's up there thinking about eternity. And he's going to live forever. So that is the Holy One. But he's also thinking about good people. Verse 3, he's thinking about all these other good people, that God will not abandon them to the grave forever. And God will not abandon them to death or decay. The future eternity he's up sleeping about they will go in verse 11 to the fullness of joy they will go to your right hand I'm going to go up to god where there are pleasures forever so uh he was up all night thinking about worries he was up all night thinking about troublemakers now he's up all night thinking about life is going to go on and on and on this does make me think about fights in Jesus' day and fights in Paul's day. The Pharisees believed in life after death. The Sadducees did not. I think that's amazing. It's Acts 23, 18, which that means the chief priests didn't believe in life after death. The people running the temple, like Caiaphas, did not believe in life after death. And they were running the whole worship system. And they're running the whole temple. I hope there aren't that many liberals in our city. Um, I, I, know, I know which the most liberal churches are, but I'm not so sure that they're all, any of them are that liberal that don't believe in life after death. But the people running the temple in Jesus' day did not believe in life after death. It says it. It's right here in Psalm 16. It's in Job chapter 9 that uh, uh, after his flesh is decayed, yet in my flesh I will see God. So it's in Job 19. It's in Daniel chapter 12. Those in the dust of the earth will awake. So it's in the Old Testament. But the Sadducees who ran the Temple in Jesus' day says, uh, we're not going to believe it. David said it. Daniel said it. Isaiah said it. Depending on how it's interpreted, Ezekiel has the dry bones coming alive. And yet, the people running the temple in Jesus' day said, we do not believe in life after death. Even though here, David is up all night thinking about he's going to live after death. They really were quite something, those Sadducees. It says they didn't believe in angels didn't believe in spirits, didn't believe in life after death, and they're there running the temple. I mean, it's the next thing to being atheists, running the religious services. Now, here's a little game they played, and I've repeated this several times. They said, we won't believe it unless it's in Moses. We don't care, David taught it. David's up all night thinking, I'm going to live forever. We don't care. We don't care that King David taught it. We don't care that Isaiah taught it. We don't care that Job taught it. We have to find it in Moses. And uh, that's kind of where Jesus said that. He said in the book of Moses, this is Mark chapter 12, 
where he told Moses at the burning bush, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He didn't say I was their God. He said, I still am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they had died centuries before Moses, but they're still alive. And I am their God right now here at the burning bush. When Jesus told that to the Sadducees, they shut up. And walked away. And the book of Matthew says they did not dare to ask him any more questions. So Jesus found in Moses life after death. That Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still alive in the days of Moses. But it was already here even more clearly in David. There's quite something. We're not going to believe it if David taught it. But here he's up all night thinking... I'm going to live forever. So we have up all night with worries. We have all night with troublemakers. And now we have up all night. This will not be the last day. And it's going to go on and on. And after my lifespan, I will live forever. Now next we have a little twist. Well, people are up all night. And what are they doing in these other verses? They're thinking about what evil they can do. They're not like the good ones that we've looked at so far. They're up all night thinking about evil. If you'll uh, please turn to Psalm 36. We'll look at Psalm 36, verse 4. And I will add some additional verses where people are up all night thinking about evil. If you found verse 36, we can say these people aren't even saved. You know, they're ungodly in verse 1. Verse 1 also, there is no fear of God, no reverence, don't care. Now we get to verse 4. He plans wickedness upon his bed. He sets himself on a path that is not good. He does not despise evil. So, uh they're up all night. Are they thinking about turning their worries over to God and turning their troublemakers over to God? Or are they up all night saying, I really was mad, I was wronged, but I need to find something good to do about it? No, they're not thinking about these things. Are they up all night thinking about the days are going to go on and on and on and I'll live forever? No, they're not thinking about these things. They're up all night planning evil. Proverbs 4, 16, they cannot sleep unless they do evil. And uh, Proverbs 4 also says they want to trip good people over. Micah 2, 1 and 2, woe to those who scheme iniquity, who work out evil upon their beds. When morning comes, they do it. Well, it's talking about unsaved people, hopefully not us. There are Bible stories like this. King Ahab could not sleep. And Jezebel saying, like, what's wrong with you that you don't eat or sleep? He wants Naboth's field, and Naboth won't sell him that field. And so Jezebel wakes up and makes a lying statement to their courts and sends it over there to the witnesses who lie and said Naboth did this and he's executed and evil Ahab who could not sleep got his field and it didn't do any good King Saul could not sleep David was playing him harp music to get him to sleep but Saul threw a spear at him up all night planning evil Ahab and Jezebel there is such a thing as Christians up all night, and maybe they're doing, didn't plan it, but that's what happened. That would be David and Bathsheba. So we have a case of being up all night planning evil. Number one was giving worries to God. Number two, giving anger to God and people that did wrong things to us. Number three, up all night thinking about, I'm going to live forever and ever and ever. Here is a up all night planning evil. But uh, we'll do a little better now. They're up all night saying, I have been forgiven. 
and I'll read a couple for us, but why don't you go ahead and go to, let's see, Psalm 32. And we'll catch you in a minute at Psalm 32. And this person is not up all night planning evil, but this person is up all night either wanting forgiveness or being glad that they were forgiven. And uh, I will read for us Psalm 6, and then we will come to Psalm 32 shortly. Here's Psalm 6. I am weary with sighing. Every night I make my bed, I dissolve my couch with my tears. My eye has wasted away with grief. It has become old because of my adversaries. Here's the prayer. He's up all night. Six, one and two. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your wrath. Be gracious to me. Heal me. My soul is greatly dismayed. So here's a person up all night thinking about guilt and uh, asking for forgiveness praying, uh, please forgive me now, there be no chastisement. Now, there is no chastisement with God the judge, as in death penalty, but there can be chastisement with God the Father, like spanking us. And there is a person in uh, Psalm 6, up all night, saying, uh, take care of this. We all have turned to Psalm 32. And uh, let's glance at verse 4 to make sure we're getting up at night verses. Verse 4 says, day and night, I felt stress over this sin. So it's including night. So we put it in the up at night verses. And it says in verse 4, my vitality was drained away from me. It seems like I've got a fever and it's too hot. But now in verses 5 through 7, he's up all night, and uh, it's going to end with, I already was forgiven, and he's feeling good up at night. Verse 5, I acknowledge my sin to you. My iniquity I did not hide. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave me the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found, before there's any chastisement. Surely in a flood of great waters they shall not reach him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. And he ends up being happy about it all. You surround me with songs of deliverance. Uh, David was already saved when he wrote Psalm 32. He's not talking about uh, feeling the guilt of an unsaved person. He's not talking about worry about eternal punishment. But he's up all night and he wants forgiveness because he doesn't want any of this chastisement. He says in verse 5, he did not cover up his sins. We use that phrase too all the time. Unfortunately, it's on the news all the time, the cover-ups. He did not cover up as if it never happened. Verse 6, he prayed before there was any chastisement, before God would, uh, you know, run out of patience that he hasn't confessed his sin yet. He prayed before then. Verse 7, then God was his hiding place. We'd say like a fortress, uh, like a refuge. And there can be songs of deliverance. So even though he was up all night, he was mainly happy in the end because he had confessed his sin and he was forgiven and uh, his load was taken away. Uh, that is in the Bible too. Often a word for forgiveness in the Old Testament is to pick up something heavy and God takes it away. It'd be like we're carrying something very heavy on our backs and it's strapped to us. And forgiveness is picking it up and moving it away. Verse 5 does give three of the words for sin in the Bible. Uh, we could get by without it, but sin in verse 5, uh, that means missing the mark. It's used in the book of Judges of left-handed slingers who could throw a sling stone and never sin. It's the same word. 
never miss the mark. And so when we hear that, like falling short, Romans 3, sin is missing the mark. We have here also iniquity. Iniquity refers to a twist. It still comes down into our language when we say crook or crooked. The crook goes off the path of what is right. And crooked hurts. And the Hebrew word has both. Iniquity means to go off the path and it will hurt. It will be like a crook in the neck or a crook in the back. So sin means to fall short. Iniquity means to twist and it hurts. Uh, then we have transgression, which is uh, going past the boundary line. It says, do not go here. The Bible says, do not do this. Do not go past this point. And transgression is, we know it says, do not go past this point. And we do it anyway. And the psalmist is up all night, happy, that he had done these things, but close of verse 5, you forgave my sin. You lifted it up and carried it away. We have one more this morning. And if you'll come to Psalm 127, that will give us our final one. And I'll kind of review them all in a moment. This is a not quite waking up with worries and waking up with anger and waking up thinking about eternity, waking up thinking about forgiveness. This is Psalm 127 where he stays asleep because everything is okay. Psalm 127 verse 2. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late. To eat the bread of painful labors, for he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. Well, we have all kinds of verses that say to work hard, so we should try. And every day we should try our do list to get done and do as much as we can. But then, at the end of the day, maybe not all of it got done. Maybe not every goal got accomplished. Maybe not every problem got done and over with. And verse 2 is saying, sleep anyway. God takes care of us even in our rest. So here are our up at night verses. And next time we'll do more direct Christmas verses. I actually am planning on doing the wise men. But uh, this one today is a little bit pre-Christmas. He's up at night, gives his worries over to God, troublemakers especially, gives his anger over to God, even though it was right, gives it over to God. Be ye angry, it's okay, but don't sin, and turn it into a motivation of doing what is right. He's up all night thinking, here's another day that's ended, but life will not end. In your presence is fullness of joy forever and ever. Up at night, wanting forgiveness, then up all night, getting forgiveness, and then songs of deliverance. The musicians, please come. 